Jing, hi, hello, and welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here. I always love to start by getting you to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and what your business is. Great. Yeah. Um, so my name is Jing. I'm the founder of Fly by Jing, and we make premium, all natural uh, Chinese food and condiments. Um, we're about two and a half years old and uh, mainly direct to consumer. Although this year we are entering into new channels, including retail. Um, and we're on Amazon as well. And um, a little background on me, I'm currently based in LA where I founded the business. But before that, I lived about 10 years in Asia, in China, Singapore. Um, and that's where I really um, got deep into Chinese food and the culture. And um, I was working in tech at the time, but I was just passionate about I mean, the flavors, but also just shining a light on the culture. And so I did that through writing and media projects. And eventually I quit my day job in tech and I started a restaurant in Shanghai, which then led to Fly by Jing, which is a line of, you know, packaged um, products, food products. But um, I'm originally from Chengdu. So the flavors of Fly by Jing are inspired by my hometown. <clears throat> and the fly in Fly by Jing is actually um, a reference or an ode to this type of restaurant in Chengdu called Fly Restaurant, which are hole in the walls that are so delicious that they are said to attract people like flies. So um, the flavors are incredible and the energy is so vibrant. And I just wanted to capture all of that in, in my products. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I think it was in 2018, I was actually in China in Guangzhou and I loved those kind of restaurants that were the hole in the wall things where, you know, you would just go up and you would see obviously all the locals going there and you would just go up and be like, I'll have what everyone else is having. They were my favorite thing. I absolutely loved it. I want to ask you about the, I know you were building your restaurant at the time and you were obviously consumed with this amazing food and this amazing culture, but what was the specific aha moment where you were like, yep, we're going to do condiments. We're going to do pantry staples of Chinese cuisine. So I think um, to tell that story, I need to back up a little bit and kind of uh, go into my my life story a little. So I was born in Chengdu, but um, I grew up moving around a lot. So I lived in lots of different countries across Europe and in Canada, uh, moved around with my parents' job. And um, that, you know, it was, it was a really um, amazing experience living in so many different countries and being exposed to so many cultures. But at the same time, it was kind of a feeling that I needed to adapt myself for every place I was in, right? So code switch in a way, try to fit in. And so um, I feel like um, as amazing as that upbringing was, I became very disconnected from my heritage and who I was because I felt like I often had to have a put up a facade, um, you know, to for, for what other people expected me to be. And so um, in my 20s, when I uh, went to China with, my job at the time, I um, was just, you know, pretty obsessed with trying to dig deeper and try to like uncover some of the aspects of, of my cultural identity. Um, and so that's how it started. And then as I was learning more about Chinese food, I was realizing just how little of that um, 5,000 year heritage really made its way to the West. Like people didn't know about it. People misunderstood it. And in fact, there was all kinds of false narratives that existed up, up about it. And so <clears throat> everything from, you know, the value of Chinese food to how it should taste, how, you know, what, what ingredients should be in there, whether it's healthy or not. Um, and you know, the price point. And so um, in 2018, actually, I um, at the time I was running this underground supper club or like a dining concept in Shanghai, um, which I called Fly by Jing. And there was modern Sichuan flavors that were, you know, inspired by my experience having lived all over, but really rooted in the um, techniques and the ingredients of the region. So um, <clears throat> kind of marrying uh, tradition with modernity in a way. But I was traveling, I came to the U.S. and I went to Expo West, which is the largest 
natural foods expo in the world. And um, that's where all of these stores like Whole Foods and, you know, all the buyers from these stores are looking for the, the next big, you know, food innovation. And so there's usually thousands of stalls and um, several days of this kind of big fair. And uh, I realized after walking the halls that there were so little Asian flavors present. Um, pretty much, you know, I could count on one hand the number of brands that did Asian food. So I realized that there was a huge opportunity there because um, it is 2018 and, you know, clearly the U.S. is much more diverse and people have much more demands for, you know, more interesting flavors than what was being presented. So that summer I um, launched a Kickstarter to launch a few, uh, like actually one of my core products, um, which was a sauce that I was using in my cooking. Um, it was like a flavor base for some of my dishes. And I realized that it was actually shelf stable. I could put it in a jar and sell it. So I started in Shanghai just by selling little jars like to friends and family and, um, you know, had a little online shop. But that Kickstarter was really the first time that I introduced it to the U.S. audience. And it ended up doing extremely well. It was the highest funded craft food project on Kickstarter. And it allowed me to, um, you know, it allowed me to produce my first big batch at scale. So um, that's kind of how it all started. And the, the light bulb moment was really when I went to Expo West. And since our Kickstarter, the amazing reception that we've gotten and all of the word of mouth and the organic growth has really you know, brought us to this point where we are now. So, mm, Oh, my gosh, that's so cool. I'm always interested about Kickstarter campaigns because obviously they can be a great success, but they can also be a terrible flop if you don't, you know, put in the effort and the the work to make them succeed. What were the kinds of things, when you look back in hindsight, what were the kinds of things that made your campaign successful aside from being, you know, just a truly unique product on the platform? The product itself, um, you know, should be able to tell a story. Right. And then that enables you to tell a richer story around it. So for us, the the message and, and that was inherent in the product was about, um, you know, that made in China or Chinese food product can be some of the highest quality in the world. And this is how um, we make it. And these are the ingredients we source. And so just being really um, transparent, but also very you know, just um, the, the 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 what we were presenting was inherently unique because um, it, it didn't exist before, and and that's because a lot of the food products that made their way out of China um, had traditionally been lower priced, and as a result, um, had used like you know, much more uh, basic ingredients. And that was because manufacturers were told that people in the West would not accept anything that was, you know, more expensive than $2 for a Chinese food product, right? So um, if that was the case, then there's no incentive for them to put anything of quality into it. And so I actually faced a lot of resistance in manufacturing um, my sauces at scale in the beginning, because no, no co-packer would be willing to go through the effort of sourcing or um, all of the different techniques that I required for my sauce. So it was a very difficult journey to get that made. And so it was, you know, it became apparent to me why most of the products on the market were quite watered down. Um, so, you know, just telling even that story of the, the craftsmanship that goes into it, the sourcing, the ingredients, that was compelling as a story. And um, at the end of the day, brands are stories, right? And so Kickstarter is actually a really effective way to tell stories. It's, it's um, you know, you can craft a very compelling page with a video, with, you know, the visuals that you present on the page. So I think that was um, a big part of it. The second would be just... I mean, it's a lot of work to run a Kickstarter campaign. A lot of it is getting people to come on your page. So whether it's like every single person that you've ever met in your life, just emailing them, um, you know, asking them to come and support, 
um, or reaching out to bloggers and media. Um, so I had cold emailed um, a few writers who I thought, you know, had written about similar things in the past and might be interested and uh, ended up getting um, placements in New York Magazine and Savor on the day of launch, which was really great because um, there's I mean, Kickstarter works on these algorithms that, you know, they'll show you to more people the, the more traffic you're getting. And so you want to actually hit your um, goal on the first day for it to kind of snowball. And so, um, I mean, there's so many different techniques for, for Kickstarter um, and there's great resources actually on the Kickstarter website. Um, but I think, you know, for anyone who's starting out of business and doesn't have the capital, this is um, one of the best ways still um, to, to launch. Yeah, totally. Did you have to invest a lot of your own money to make that Kickstarter campaign successful? So I built that campaign myself. Um, I had spent about $3,000 on a video that I paid my friend to make for me. So um, I think the video is really amazing. And <clears throat> if it wasn't my friend, you know, creating it, it probably would have cost more. But um, so that's that's all I spent on it. Um, and, you know, but I definitely you have to do the legwork to figure out, like, you know, how you're actually going to produce it if you do get the money. Um, because yeah, people want to know that if they're giving you the money as much as they're, because it's Kickstarter, so they're very supportive of entrepreneurship. And so there's the understanding that this may not come to fruition, but you still need to kind of, you know, convince them that you know what you're doing enough for them to give you their $20 or something like that. Yeah. Right. Totally. How much was the goal that you set and how much did you raise? And then what did you use that money for? Like, was it all to do with manufacturing or did it go into other ways, you know, marketing the brand from there onwards, for example? I think I um, set set the goal for $25,000. Um, and I think we hit like $250,000. Um, so it was, it was a big success. Um, yeah, we, we did it on Kickstarter and then we had a follow on, on Indiegogo as well. So the, there's, um, you know, Kickstarter only allows you to, to do it for like, you know, 30 days or something. And then Indiegogo, it kind of extends for another few months. Um, <clears throat> and, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think, uh, $25,000 would have been enough to run the first big batch, but of course, you know, running a business is expensive. I also decided to move to LA to, um, to do this. So, you know, that enabled me to move to LA, set up the business and really like, you know, kick it off for the first few months. Um, and fulfillment as well. I mean, there's so many different costs that you don't think about. Like we ended up doing really well. So there was like over 3000 people we needed to ship stuff to, but I obviously couldn't do it by myself in my, in my living room, in my studio apartment in LA. So we had to hire a 3PL to do that. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it really was like a, a startup funds for the first, I would say it lasted us for probably about a year. And I was just one person at the time. So, um, and I didn't, I didn't pay myself. So it was like everything went back into the business. That's amazing. That's so cool that you had kind of that first batch of, say, 3,000, I think you said it was, 3,000 customers to kind of launch off from. But how do you then spread the word even further outside of those 3,000? And what did you kind of do to, to really keep that momentum and go to the next level? The great thing about Kickstarter, again, is that it is a platform that attracts people who are more trendsetters or innovators. So they're willing to take a risk to support something brand new. And so they usually tend to be the people in their communities that people trust for advice on things like food or travel or gadgets. And so um, that was kind of great because it was a built in, you know, word of mouth, um, built in like street team to promote you. So we grew a lot from just, um, just like, you know, people recommending it to their friends and family. And so, and you get, you know, the email list of all those people, right? So when we officially then launched um, on, uh, I think it was six months later, when we officially launched our direct-to-consumer website, 
um, you know, I was able to blast an email to everybody and just tell them. And, and by that point, they had already probably finished the j- initial jars that they received. And so <clears throat> it just kind of started from there. Um, and then, of course, press has been really important. I think um, the Kickstarter did really well. So it attracted a lot, a lot of attention from food media. So once we launched, we continued to get a lot of press. Um, and so I think you know, for the first year, we didn't do any paid ads. And it was really just um, word of mouth. So the product itself should be, you know, inherently kind of viral because of, you know, its unique aspects. And then, um, you know, the the press definitely, definitely helps. So customer service is a big component, because, you know, with when when people are supporting a, a startup brand like this, they feel a personal connection to the founder. And so it was really important for me in the beginning, I was like trying to write as many personal notes as possible to my customers um, and any customer service, you know, issues, shipping issues, delays, whatever, it all came directly to me. And so I was answering every single one. And so that kind of builds that, you know, report and that began building our community, which now is like extremely strong, but, at the time, it was like just me, you know, in my in my apartment answering emails. Um, so I think it's a combination of product and just providing great service. Yeah. And I guess that that great service really builds that foundation of trust. And, and like what you said before, building that bond between the founder and the community um, and people wanting to continue to empower and support and lift you up. Before we move on from the Kickstarter thing, just a final question there. Do you think in 2021, if you were to launch a Kickstarter campaign now in 2021, would it have the same success? I'm wondering because when I speak to founders who have used Kickstarter, it was, you know, a couple of years ago. And I'm wondering if the platform has that same kind of charm to it now. I think so. I think it does. Because even, you know, when I launched the Kickstarter in 2018, that was already, you know, probably 10 plus years um, since they first launched and, you know, since, um, yeah, but I was, I think, you know, there's thousands of new Kickstarters launched every day. But if you look at, um, if you kind of like look at all of their, uh, the campaigns on the platform, past campaigns, etc., you can kind of filter it to see which ones have done the best right, in the different categories. And so that's what I did. It's like I kind of looked at what was performing the best and really studied those pages. Because um, you'll see that there's, you know, on a on a constant basis, there's there's Kickstarter, there's um, launches that don't meet their goal. And then there's launches that like, do like $10 million. So it's like, there, you can stand out with the right story with the right product, but it's really just um, you know, uh, studying, studying what it is that those, those guys are doing. Um, but it's a combination of things. There's, there's a lot of like, you know, there's an algorithm to play into. There's a lot of tips and tricks. Um, and a lot of people launch Kickstarter without really understanding that. And that's why most campaigns don't do it as well. Um, and I think, you know, I just asked as many people as I could who had multi-million dollar campaigns and got a lot of great advice from them. Yeah, love that. Definitely ask the people who have done it well and the people who haven't done it well, for that matter. Um, so you said in the first year you were doing it by yourself. You had a lot of press. That's actually how I came across you, by the way. I uh, first read about you in Lean Lux and, you know, became became a follower, became a bit of a fan of what you were doing. But what were the key kind of tipping points and t- 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 and key <laughs> growth points for you following that first kind of initial year? It was a one person operation for a while. And then I um, got accepted to a tech accelerator called Techstars. And, um, you know, I don't actually recommend, you know, tech accelerators for for every CPG company. It, it was appropriate for us because I come from a tech background as well. So I kind of felt like I could operate in that environment. But there's there's um there's enough, many different accelerators that you could go into um and uh i think for cpg food product there are cpg specific ones that could be much more helpful because they have the right networks they have the right mentors and so on and, and the right investor networks 
Um, Techstars is more like Y Combinator. It's much more tech focused. So, um, you know, although it wasn't, you know, very specifically CPG focused, it does teach you about scaling a business, um, what your role is as a CEO, how to fundraise and just, you know, kind of tips that would help with any business. So I think that I did pick up a lot in terms of thinking more of more, um, more about scale. Um, and so a lot of that was like understanding I couldn't keep doing everything myself. I had to let go of some of the, mm. the pieces, bring in the right people. And that my role as a CEO is really to put the right people in the roles, set the vision, and then make sure you don't run out of money. So I, before that, I was like, just trying to do everything myself. And that was actually slowing me down, right? And so once I realized that and learned that, I think it definitely um, helped me to, to, um, to, to think about growth. And so we started growing pretty rapidly from that point, maybe about 30% month over month. Um, and then I would say like the biggest turning point for us was April of last year when we got a huge mention in the New York Times that um, kind of launched us into a different stratosphere. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. The dream of every entrepreneur and startup hustler. <laughs> Love that for you. Thank you. So when it comes to tech stars, tech stars? Yeah. Tech stars, right? Now I feel like I'm saying it wrong because I've said it too many times. <laughs> are there certain, what, who are they accepting into that kind of program? Can you be at any stage or you need to have hit a certain revenue number or, you know, what are they kind of looking for in their entrepreneurs? For most of these accelerators, you could, I mean, ideally you have a, um, a proof of concept, but you could really have just the concept um, and you don't even have to have any revenue at all. And in fact, I was the only company in the class of 10 that had revenue. Um, actually, no, there was one more, but everyone else was just like, you know, had an idea and they were just exploring that idea. So these accelerators are, are kind of great for that, actually, because if you have a great idea, they help you get it off the ground and help you validate whether that actually works or not. Um, and a lot of people who go through Techstars, they might even pivot their business in the middle of the program because what they initially thought was going to work didn't. And so they were, but they were able to, and, and the great thing about these accelerators is that um, there is such a quick, like a fast kind of cycle where you're like, you know, um, you, you have an idea, you're testing the idea and then, you know, you're evaluating whether to go forward or not. And so that cycle is quite quick. Um, and so you're able to really, uh, it's like a turbo kind of learning period, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think um, it's, it's really any stage. Um, but, you know, I think if you're already really far ahead or successful, then maybe you don't want to go into something like that because they, they do take a significant amount of equity. Um, so you what's just wanna, the percentage? Um, it, it varies from accelerator to accelerator, but Techstars, I think it's 6%. Right. Got it. Cool. So where is the business today? Are you able to share a little bit about how big the team is, how big the business is? Any, every, I always love to ask about revenue, you know, um, any future partnerships that are coming up. What are, the, what are the things that you can shout about and paint the picture for us? Yeah. So we, um, I mentioned the New York Times article, which really, um, you know, I mean, it sold us out of several months of inventory overnight and we did more in that one month than we did in the entire year before um oh wow so, that's so cool yeah so since then um we've kind of sustained and, and grown from there so um <clears throat> at the i think that was in april and by august i had hired um three people and um, we actually just um, closed a Series A round of fundraising and um, added four more people to the team. So now we're, I think we're 10. And um, yeah, and so last year we ended up doing 10x what we did our first year, um, which has been incredible in light of, you know, the circumstances. Um, and, um, and yeah, and I think, you know, um, 
we just happen to, you know, make something that, you know, provides a lot of ease and flavor for, for people cooking at home or even not cooking because it's good. It's just a condiment like hot sauce that you can put on anything. So, you know, even if you don't cook and just get takeout, you, you know, it's still, it still works. So we've been really lucky in that regard. And, um, you know, now we are looking at entering, um, natural channels like Whole Foods. Um, we're actually launching in Whole Foods in September. And oh, also, congratulations. thank you. And also Target in October, which is super exciting. Um, I never thought that, you know, my products would be in Target, but it's happening. Um, so yeah, so we're really, um, excited about, you know, growing into new channels because our goal really is to become a household name. Um, the way that like a Heinz ketchup is, you know, and there really isn't a household name in the Asian food space quite yet. So, um, we're looking to change that. We're looking to build a platform that equates to the highest quality Chinese food in the world. So, you know, people, um, I think get a sense of that when they interact with our, with our brand, um, on socials or on our site, um, with our communications. People really get a sense of that, um, that dedication to integrity and quality. And I think, you know, as, um, as we bring them onto the platform, onto the community through these flavors, we are thinking about, you know, other, um, other ways for them to enjoy those flavors, maybe even, uh, in an even easier way. So, you know, we are launching food products. Um, you know, maybe not ready to eat, but like ready to cook type of food products. So later this year, um, we'll be coming out with a few really exciting new products. And, um, yeah. So in terms of revenue, I think, you know, we're, we're, um, this is our second year and we're about, um, in the 10 to $20 million range. Um, and we started out our first year was, only like two or three hundred thousand so oh um, my god <laughs> yeah so it's been it's been really great growth in, in the last year and um so we brought on um a partner very recently so that we can continue our growth and, and expand into new channel continue to skyrocket when you think about your journey and yourself as an entrepreneur what do you think your superpower is? Um, I think that I have a good sense of what people want because, I mean, it's just really leaning into what do I want and trusting that, you know. And um, I think it's really, you know, trusting your intuition because for the longest time I didn't really, like, um, I – I would second guess myself all the time. So, so really just leaning into my gut and, um, you know, being a keen observer of what's happening. Like, so the, the way that Fly by Jane came about was from observing what the U.S. market was like, but also what was happening on the ground in China and just noticing that, um, you know, this kind of new school of, um, entrepreneurs in China who were, um, cooking super creatively and not bound by any rules. And uh, meanwhile, in the West, it seemed like we were kind of preoccupied with keeping things in a box, like Chinese food needs to be this way. It can't be any other way. It has to be this price, not any other way. And like, so it was just like, it felt very stifling. And so um, just, you know, being just trusting my gut and, in, in um, saying that the U.S. market is ready for really high quality Chinese food and none of the other bullshit. And let's just do this and, and um, stick to um, with, the, with the production as well, you know, because I mentioned there was so many so much resistance from co-packers to doing things the way that I, I wanted them to, um, but just really sticking to it. And I think that insistence on the quality, on the techniques, inherently made the product unique in the market because I knew how difficult it was to get there and that, you know, it was unlikely that anyone else would, would go to such lengths. 
Um, and so it, it just made the product um, instantly unique. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it's really leaning into the gut, um, but then also, yeah, just like the other, the other um, thing is like working creatively within constraints. So um, we were bootstrapped, like the Kickstarter was, was the only funding we really received for the longest time until just last month. So, um, you know, without resources, without even employees, um, how do you make decisions? How do you, um, you know, just do more with less? And I think that's another superpower is just like sometimes restraints or constraints actually help you think more creatively. Mm, that's so true. Yeah, I love that. What is the main piece of advice or learning that you want women who are earlier on in their entrepreneurial journey to know and to take away from this episode? Um, I think it would be, you know, what I had just said. I think, honestly, it's like, you know, um, know what it is that you want to achieve and, and that one thing I always say is like, make sure that you, um, you, this project is, or this business is something that you have to do. Like there's nothing else that you could do because this journey is difficult. It is tedious. It's never ending. And, um, you really need to be sure that, um, be sure of like what's driving you, right? Because there's going to be long nights where you're, it's a lonely journey as well. And so you often need that kind of North star to guide you along. Um, so a, I would say it's that. And then B is just like sticking to your um, integrity on, <clears throat> on what it is that you want to achieve because everyone at every step of the way is going to try to divert you from that. Uh, you know, anyone who's founded a business will know that they hear, they hear no many more times than they hear yes. Right. And so um, it's really about just sticking to your conviction um, because if I had accepted no's like along the way when I was working with the co-packers, then the product would be much more watered down than it is today. So, um, so yeah, so those would be the two, the two pieces of advice. Thank you so much. That's great. I love that advice. I think sticking to your guns is such a key one. We are up to the six quick questions part of the episode. I ask every woman uh, the same six quick questions so that we can look back over time and see if anything came out that was similar and that kind of thing. Some of it we might have already covered, but we asked them all the same. So question number one is, what's your why? Why do you do what you do? I'm building Fly by Jing because um, I saw a lack of diversity in the natural food space. And what we hope to achieve through Fly Medging is to create space for more diverse stories to exist. So ours is just one tiny piece of the puzzle, but um, by, you know, by creating more space, we're hoping to, um, you know, allow others or inspire others to, to do the same. I love that. Question number two, and so important. Question number two is what has been, and I think I might already know the answer to this, what has been the number one marketing moment that made the business pop? So I would say, you know, the New York Times was definitely one, but the the other major moment in November was the uh, rebrand that we did. Um, so if you Google the initial Kickstarter, it was a very different branding system. Um, and that was, you know, initially it was just like to do something that, you know, drew your attention in. And um, eventually, you know, uh, I felt like the brand outgrew it. And um, we represented a lot more than than just, you know, a flashy hot sauce, for example. So um, the new rebrand, our tagline is not traditional, but personal, which really, I think, encapsulates our, our story and our mission. Because, um, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of people have their ideas, their formed ideas about what Chinese food is. But we wanted to express that there's so much more diversity that exists within Chinese food and that it's not just one monolith. And so this is a very personal story. And so, you know, there's no use in kind of trying to fit it into your frame of reference. Um, and so uh, in doing so, you know, we're also saying like there's room for more 
of these products to exist. And so not traditional, but personal became, you know, I think when we launched that rebrand, people instantly got it. And so it helped us to no longer have to explain ourselves all the time. It's like literally written on our jar. So. Yeah, I love the rebrand and I, I have so much fun on your website. It brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> Question number three is, where do you hang out to get smarter? What are you reading or listening to or subscribing to that others would benefit from knowing about? Um, I listen to so many podcasts. So podcasts exactly like this one. Um, I, you know, obviously like how I built this. Um, and uh, there's a number of, you know, other CPG D2C podcasts as well. Twitter is a really good place. Um, there's a D to C Twitter is, uh, is definitely its own ecosystem. Um, you know, we, we talked about lean Lux, um, lean Lux and 2 PM, um, our newsletters that I, you know, subscribe to, uh, thing testing, but, um, it's, it's honestly, it's like the wisdom of other founders. So, um, I've been very lucky to have a great support group of other founders who, are all going through this journey. And so we often get together and like swap tales and um, help each other out. And that's been the biggest um, source of growth. Mm, absolutely. I love that. Question number four is how do you win the day? What are your AM or PM rituals and habits that keep you feeling successful and happy and motivated? I sleep and wake up really early. That I think is the biggest game changer. I will go to sleep out as soon as it gets dark. <laughs> oh my gosh, really early. So what time do you get well, up then? <laughs> well, I get up, um, I usually wake up around before five, around five or before that, but I'll sleep around nine. Um, and I think that's for me, you know, I'm not uh, necessarily an early, a morning person, but um, I just find that, you um, for me, like the early quiet hours of the day is when I can do the most deep work. So I like to I like to have that because I feel like once you get into like, you know, 9, 10 a.m., like all the meetings start and like it's just harder to collect your thoughts afterwards. So I like to have a big block of time where I can just think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. I like the morning time as well. If you were given a thousand dollars of no strings attached grant money, where would you spend that money? That's a great question. Um, well, we work with a lot of um, organizations, um, nonprofits, um, whether it's like to fight food insecurity or to support the rights of, you know, sex workers and, um, you know, in, in many different communities. So um, it may be to support one of our partners, um, I also am a big proponent of investing in our team and, um, you know, so on whether it's like education or, you know, um, you know, just uh, any activities that allow the members of my team to feel like they're living up to their highest potential. And so there's a lot of, um, we, we often do offsites where we, um, you know, talk about company goals, but also personal. And um, I think that's like the most, that's, that's actually, I think our secret sauce is just like the, the culture that we have internally. So is either investing in a partner or, um, or internally in our culture. Oh, love that. Some spicy mugs on the weekends. <laughs> just kidding. Question number six, last question is how do you deal with failure? What's your mindset and approach when things don't go to plan? Yeah. Um, things often don't go to plan. And I think sometimes in one day you can have a failure and a huge success. So that's just the journey of an entrepreneur. Um, so it's just keeping it in perspective that like, you know, oftentimes you get your highest, you get your greatest successes that follow what seem to be the greatest failure. So just understanding and keeping that perspective to, to, you know, um, that uh, that nothing is ever as bad as it seems and nothing is also as great as it seems. So just, um, you know, having having that perspective is um, will get you through anything. Jing, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show today and share your journey and tell us about your brand. I've absolutely loved meeting you and I cannot wait to try your products. <laughs> 